had a DM that was obsessed with control and punishing the players. He said that Nat 1s and 20s didn't actually do anything outside of combat and quoted that whenever someone rolled a 20. However, if one of the players rolled a Nat 1, he punished us to the extreme. The player was trying to perform to get a discount on a healing potion. He rolled a Nat 1. The DM had him crash into a cabinet. It toppled over and broke everything, and the shopkeeper had a heart attack and died on the spot. No death saves, and no one was allowed to magically heal him or cast Revivify. The shopkeeper's son came in, says we murdered his dad, and now there is a witch hunt for us from the entire town we saved a few years ago. The guy puts us on trial and sentences us all to death. That was the last game any of us ever played with that guy. People say that escalated quickly all the time, but I don't think that quote entirely summarizes what just happened in that story. I mean, I've never seen anything escalate any quicker in my entire life. The important thing to understand here is this group has been playing almost weekly for about a year. We meet Thursdays at a local game store. We have a very good group chemistry and have a good loot sharing system in place, i.e. the ranger gets the magic arrows, the monk gets the dragon hide belt that only monks can attune to, etc. Effectively, whomever can best use the item for the benefit of the party gets the item. We split gold evenly. Plain, efficient, simple, agreeable. Cue this dude. Since it is a public game, we allow new players from time to time. So, when a 40-something guy asked to join, we didn't really have a reason to say no. He had never played 5th edition, didn't have dice or a character sheet, no minis or character made, so as a player, for the first 30 minutes of last week's session, we spent it helping him to build a character. That is no big deal, honestly. He's new to 5th edition, loved to help. It was this week's game, and that is where the horror begins. First, after being told the table is now full the previous week, he brings his 13-ish year old son to the game store and asks if he can play. Our DM is far too nice to say no, meaning she is now in the position of agreeing to DM a 7th player or saying no and making a kid sit in a store for 3 hours. So she says yes. Did the kid have a character ready? No. No, he didn't. Second, upon killing the Mimics and Coven of Hags, our party found a lot of loot. I mean a lot. We all had a hearty supply of gold and platinum each, 2,000 gold, along with a bunch of magic items. Here is where things got weird at the table. My character finds a magical quiver, hands it to the only player character in the group with any kind of bow slash crossbow, the Arcane Archer. No one else in the party uses bows or crossbows. The new player character. You're just giving that to her? Yeah, she's the only one who will be able to use it to its potential. Well, I earned that too. I want my percentage of it. What do you mean? We need to find out how much it's worth, and she needs to pay me for a percentage of it. Whole group and DM minus the new player's son spends the next 10 minutes explaining how loot is shared that we divvy up magic items to those who can use them most. It is common for the group to spend large amounts of money for others in the group when they are low on funds, etc. We also take time to explain his wizard character is getting two new spells, we found scrolls, and he can pick from the items we left. We literally had like 10 magic items. New player character just scoffed the entire time, as if the group way of divvying up loot was unbelievably incorrect. That's not even the end of it. I will also say he was upset my character got the winged boots. All you need to know is that in our Discord, we have a magic item wishlist section. I asked for this a while back. My DM, being the merciful and generous god she is, put them in the game, so they were for me. He didn't like that, even after it was explained. Later, we needed to identify all of these items. The new player character didn't take identify as a spell. To shorten the section up, he, the wizard player character, demanded that the entire party all chip in money so he can buy a 50 gold piece identify scroll. 50 gold pieces out of the thousands he had just earned. When we asked why he couldn't cover it, it effectively came down to, if I'm going to take up space in my spell book and use it for the party, then the party should pay for the scroll. This was another 5 minute discussion that ended with him just not buying the scroll at all. The DM allowed me to purchase identify services, out of my pocket of course, always here to help the party, and we got everything identified. New player character was also mad at that, like he was mad he lost the bargaining chip or something. Finally, new player character needs to identify something in the store, so he buys the scroll and uses it, doesn't even put it in his book. This one may have just been inexperienced with the rules or wizards, but still, it was annoying. 
going. Luckily, the DM doesn't have to DM for anyone, and they will not be rejoining us next session. The store has our back as well. There was a bit more I didn't include here, but yeah, you get the gist. I feel like we haven't had a loot ninja on the show for a little bit. This is the guy that's constantly rolling need on the dungeon loot. And yeah, it is incredibly annoying. In the grand scheme of RPG horror stories, of course, we'd classify it under mildly infuriating, if anything, but it's still not great to have in your game, and definitely some problem player behavior. This is straight up selfish playing. Someone who doesn't care about the rest of their group and only prioritizes their own character or their own story. Of course, in D&D, there can be debate on who deserves the loot the most or who needs it the most. There are some items that are not class-specific, and by some, I mean many, many items that are not class-specific, and who it goes to can be up for debate. But that's not what this guy is trying to do. He's trying to get his cut of everything and not thinking about what the rest of the group needs in any way whatsoever. Basically, yeah, selfish play. This isn't a major horror story, but the initial shock of the moment really hurt. In short, I lost all of my dice. I parked my car in my usual spot and came back to a broken window and a bunch of missing items, one of them being my dice bag. I just really wish there was a convenient place to get more dice. Well, luckily, I found Arcana Vault. That's right, everyone, Arcana Vault is back as the sponsor of today's video. Their website is a treasure trove for beautiful resin, metal, and even gemstone dice, all for your Dungeons & Dragons games, or whatever TTRPG you're playing. Arcana Vault's most popular product by far is their Arcana Black Mystery Packs, which contain a random set of either acrylic or resin dice, and it is guaranteed to be a complete set, all for just $10. If you don't want to get a random set though and you want something a bit more specific, their website is still full of incredible dice. And not only are they incredible, they are also inexpensive. So you're not breaking the bank just to get some beautiful polyhedral random number generators. Oh, and by the way, Arcana Vault is not going to leave you hanging with nowhere to put your dice. With all orders of $50 or more, you get a free dice tray to go along with your purchase. And if you're interested, you can head down into the description down below where you can pick up your dice from Arcana Vault. Thank you so much to Arcana Vault for sponsoring today's video. As always, supporting our sponsors does support us. Without further ado, I'm going to turn back into an animated rat so that we can get back to the video. Hello, I present to you all a story of one of the first campaigns of 5th edition that I ever played. This was close to 7 years ago, so the details are a bit fuzzy, but it sticks in my mind as one of the worst experiences I have ever had. At that time, I was new to the game and playing online via Fantasy Grounds. Since I had just started playing, I hadn't found a group to be a part of, so I shopped around for a game accepting new players. I received a response to a forum post from a dungeon master looking for players to join a game she was starting. I excitedly accepted. I was invited to a private message board for players in the game and asked to create a character and backstory. The only limits were that the race had to be from the core rules and had to be able to pass for human and couldn't be evil. Alright, no problem. I looked through the books and found an ASMR in the DMG and asked if it would be okay to use that. I got the okay and created a paladin who was off poor birth but was adopted by nobles, unable to have a child. In the backstory, it was decided that he spent several years studying in the local temple, which is where his unusual lineage was revealed to him. This entire creation process involved the GM and took suggestions from her to better fit the setting. As a reward for fleshing out a good backstory, I was offered a starting magic item. Item. I looked through the list and asked about a sword of wounding. I was denied since necrotic damage is evil, but offered a holy avenger instead. Uh, level 3. At the time, I was too inexperienced to know how game-breaking this would be, but I soon learned. Eventually, the game began. There was not a single human in the party, which consisted of myself, an elf, a dwarf, a half-elf, and a genasi. I paid, well, no heed. The initial session involved the party arriving in a town and looking for an inn. However, no NPC would tell us where to find such a place. We started asking around, bewildered, and trying to find out what our GM, who happened to be an older woman, boomer generation or thereabouts, wanted us to do. This alone was frustrating, but was further agitated by the GM, who on more than one occasion flat out told a player, no, you don't do that, or you don't say that when we did something or said something to an NPC that deviated from her plan, which she still had us fumbling around trying to figure out. 
we finally find the inn, which apparently was only an inn every once in a while while they held an arena combat battle in the basement. We're only allowed to stay there if we agree to participate. So we ship to the mandatory combat, where an apparently imprisoned wizard is being used to animate several, like 10 plus, undead to fight us. This was apparently supposed to be really hard, but the dungeon master forgot she gave me a holy avenger, so I was like one-shotting everything that wandered in range, so yeah. Problem solved. Uh, other stuff happened, including the players being told that we can't continue to stay at the inn because it was only open that one night. A botch encounter where she rolled random hit points on a pair of bandits that ended up with three hit points combined, and another hour-long hunt for whatever railroad tracks she wanted us on. Eventually, we figured out what we were supposed to do and started walking up a road to a town where the actual adventure was supposed to start. We ended it there, but we were encouraged to use the private message board as a sort of RP character chat between sessions. Several of us jumped at the chance to express our characters without being told what we can or cannot do. We'd already established that everyone was walking to the next town and any conversations would be had en route. It was during this time that the elf player made an effort to the effect of, if anyone would like to have a civilized conversation, my character speaks elvish, listing his non-common languages. I took the opportunity to retort, well, if you really wish to speak nobly, I can speak celestial, or something similar. The GM pounced on that, deleted my post, and PM'd me saying that I could not speak celestial because I promised my character would be passable as human. She also posted in a public chat that I was mistaken and couldn't actually speak that language. When I protested, she said that I could speak it, but not all will know I was doing it. Like Harry Potter? At this point, I had enough of her taking any and all agency away from us, and insisted, I have spent years studying in the temple. I'm a divine caster. I speak celestial. I was banned, immediately and kicked, all because my actions weren't human enough. TLDR, railroading GM, kicked me for deviating from the script and insisted I could speak a language provided by a race she approved. I honestly have no idea what the big deal about this guy speaking Celestial is and why it has ruined this lady's script so badly, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. In general, this sucks. Railroading to this degree is usually not really great. Now, that's not to say linear D&D campaigns can't work. They can be quite fun, in fact, but this campaign is especially egregious because the players don't know where they're supposed to go in the first place, and that is a serious issue. When your story is not presented in a cohesive or clear your way to your players, then as a storyteller, you're not really doing a great job. Combine that with a lack of choice in a game where choice is a big driving factor and you have a recipe for complete disaster. Sorry if this is a bit long, this happened a number of years ago but still sits rent free in a few of our brains and I figured I would share. We had a larger party than our usual four, so fights could get a little weird when someone could or couldn't make it. This meant the GM would try to prep as best he could for what seemed like a frequently expanding and shrinking team. I, Monk, and my partner, Wizard, were a constant, as were our friends, the Barbarian and the Rogue. We also had another archer rogue as well as a cleric, but they were a little sketchy for attendance at times. This is very relevant. I was playing a specific archetype of monk in Pathfinder called a Tatori, which specializes in grappling, including things of unusual size or physiology, but lose almost all of the usual punch and kick stuff of monks. It's a class that does cause some contention in groups, but I picked it up mostly to better learn the grappling rules without constantly needing to reference the grappling flowchart. So we were traveling through a destroyed city in some desert wastes. There were ghosts and other similar creatures around that we were mostly avoiding due to their ghastly numbers. Sneaking was working until a giant sand pit opened up, and after a bunch of checks to scramble and escape it, sucking us in, a gargantuan scorpion comes out, rumbling and initiative is called. On this day, our rogue archer wasn't with us. As per our party's usual tactics, if it's a single foe, I engage and grapple it. I get to ignore a lot of size restrictions as the party moves into positions, such as flanking for sneak attack and distance for the casters. The dungeon master was expecting me to be unable to grapple it, but the wizard casts in large person, and soon, despite the GM's annoyance, the scorpion is rapidly being monk-handled. It kept trying to sting me, but between high armor class, flurry of grapple, and my monk's immunity to poison, the party makes quick and brutal work of our monstrous vermin foe. High fives and cheers and some solid group 
work, good organization, and we were playing to our strengths. GM grumbled a bit, but we moved on. The next game, we have the full party as we are escaping the desiccated city and a massive undead purple worm comes broiling out of the sand and the GM proudly, to much group laughter, plops a loaf of bread onto the table. Cue our same strategy, but this time the GM says I cannot grapple it because it has no limbs. He also uses the in real life argument to say why my grappling doesn't work and everyone calls him out on it for being a cheap ruling when wizard can manifest fireballs and druids can transform form into plants. I was especially annoyed as it was him making a random ruling just to nerf me to make the fight go how he wanted. GM concedes with annoyance and this time with the archer present, our foe is squashed like the insect it is in record time. The damage was absolutely nuts between the two rogues and barbarian as I held it fast and all of us were super hyped and high on d6s and 20s and butter toast. We were feeling confident and excited but weren't aware of the desert storm brewing. The next game, the cleric cancels last second and we are down to five once again. The GM hates running a game without a healer of some kind, but he had planned too hard to cancel for two weeks from then. He was expecting all six of us, but adults have lives outside of the game, sadly. Reality stupid and dumb and unfair. Anyway, the encounter shouldn't be hugely different for five meant for six, right? Still in the desert, but away from the city, we get ambushed by the enemy we sought with well over a dozen archers. The wizard gets hard targeted and is terminated quickly, but not before she can get a flu spell off on our valiant archer. The melee rogue ducks off to who knows where for cover and to get a better vantage point. Or at least, that's what the coward argued. And finally, our archer engages the flying enemy wizard with bow in hand. The barbarian and I charge the guards in front of the archers and I do acrobatics to get past them into the archers. The barbarian goes on an axe murder spree while I tie up the one string harp band as best as I can. I'm holding out the best I can, but the archers are rolling a rather enormous amount of 20s, as that's what they need to hit me due to me being defensive. By the time I take out three, the barbarian has cleared about a dozen warriors and comes to help me. His damage reduction makes a joke out of the needle storm, so they keep focusing on me. Before the barbarian can clean up, the rogue is still sulking for the perfect spot. I go down, dying but not dead. A wizard falls from the sky as gracefully as a pincushion corpse can and uses a magic device by the rogue later. And the party is now back on their feet, still hurt but with two of us theoretically now able to move much faster. Proud of our feet against all odds, we pat each other's backs and compliment our ability to adapt when things go awry. I can't recall who said it but someone says, man that was tough and certainly a change from that purple worm, right? The GM explodes specifically at me he's like 55 at the time and you'd think we had just had a gender reveal party for his car and we colored it with blue paint i was preparing to call the er to prep them for burst heart valves and brain spatter now my partner and i have known the gm for like 10 plus years at this point the melee rogue has known him since university in their mutual 20s he sometimes took things personally as a player but none of us have ever seen or expected this from him as a gm he accused me of ruining his game, mocking his encounters with my abilities, and making a twinked out character that might as well be cheating sometimes. I'm sure the church would have sanctioned him a second time for the language he used, as he was already an atheist. I suggested calling the game there, and the democracy prevailed that day as we all packed up to go home. He stormed to his room, and we left in silence. The game was cancelled for like two months for him to calm down before he just called me. I was worried I'd grappled my way out of a friendship. We did end up making up over a phone call. He admitted to that not being cool of him, and his work being rough, combined with feeling like the hard work and challenges he created were being minimized into a meme. I offered to either drop the character or rewrite it due to the conflict, but after a very heartfelt apology, he told me he'd have to find another, more legitimate way to screw me over. I mean, whatever floats the group's boat, but honestly, changing up the character or rewriting it, as the OP puts it, is not a terrible way to solve this problem. It's how I solve problems of imbalance in my own D&D campaigns. I'm an outspoken advocate for DMs and players having discussions and maybe even tweaking things to try and make combat a little bit more balanced. But remember, it has to be a discussion, not an emotional explosion that destroys the group for two months. This is not acceptable behavior, especially for an adult. You should handle these situations a little bit more maturely, of course. Frustration is natural, but being able to handle that frustration in a mature way is incredibly key, not just for Dungeons & Dragons, but for all social situations. 
Despite all that, I am glad that this ended up working out for the group. Though, if the solution proves to be long term, well, we'll need to see. Hopefully the DM doesn't just trivialize this guy's grapple ability for the entire remainder of the campaign. I started playing D&D regularly in 1981 with the red box basic set after a weird one shot that I barely understood a year later in module S1 that could make for its own story here if I ever remembered enough of it. In 81, my newly single mother was trying to figure out how to handle a young son and a co-worker told her D&D was good for kids imagination. So. Off I went. By 84, I was in my first year of high school and joined up with some kids for a D&D game. One guy brought a female character and this blew my mind. Up until that point, I had been playing with my sister and random kids on the block of my old neighborhood and had somehow not realized you could play a character that wasn't yourself. Yeah, when you play in a vacuum, you miss some details. This guy made something called a drow from Advanced D&D, and that got me going on a book tour of my own. It was a forgettable one-shot, except for that one detail. That same player dropped out of our social circle a few months later. It took me a few years to run into him again and realize that racism had pushed him out. He was black, I'm mixed race, the others were white. This became relevant over the years, but my own experience with the group was about to end for a dramatic other reason. So, a few weeks on, we meet at another player's house, and the DM, that same guy who dropped out because of racism, failed to show. In fact, the next time I saw him was my senior year. So the player who was hosting us that day offered to run a one-shot of a much better than D&D game called Arduin. Whether or not Arduin was actually better, I'll never know, because this guy made me despise the idea of ever looking at the game decades after. I get the idea to try to make a female character. I've been reading a few fantasy books by a female author, Barbara Hambly. Hambly featured strong, self-reliant female protagonists, and having seen my mother grow into her own independence over the last few years, I had inspiration in a mix of someone like my mom if she'd been a rugged fantasy mercenary. That is the sweetest thing ever. But anyway, this is important to drive home that the last thing on my mind was anything NSFW. My mental image was a woman with a sword and shield, full chainmail armor, and a hiking camper mindset. She should have been the sort who would sit around the campfire telling grizzled stories of what it was like back during the war, and how a simple peasant had become a tough-as-nails kind of sort. I was happily in my headcanon forming an idea for a character I was hoping to reuse the concept of for future games, as it had been the first time I'd really been inspired to an actual concept beyond the childhood ideas of myself with a sword, or basically he's dwarf number 7 from The Hobbit. So I tell the group the basics of my character and get an okay, but then the DM hands me one of the books and says, In Arduin, you have to roll on this table if you have a female character. It was some kind of chart for her dimensions. Hips, bust, waist. I was like, obviously, all these years later, it's a rough paraphrase of how I remember things. How is this important? I think I even asked, where's the chart for the males? Surely if this is here, there must be one for size. Why would males have to roll on that? Well, exactly. Why should female characters need to roll this? I'm not doing this. If you want to play, you need to roll on the chart. <sighs> Whatever, I don't recall my exact results, but I do recall the others thought the numbers were really weird. This might sound absurd, but there I was, a 14-year-old boy in the mid-80s who had no idea what any of these numbers meant, but everyone else at the table did, had a good laugh at my results, then changed them to what they thought was better. Whatever again, let's just... Play. I don't recall most of the session, but at some point early on we were walking through a field and the DM has his own DMPC. Yep, there is also a DMPC story in part. His character is basically Elric, including the sword. I've never read Elric, but it's been described to me enough times. Basically some kind of elf-like brooding guy played by Henry Cavill since before Henry Cavill was even born with a sword that drinks souls. And Geralt, I mean Elric, or is it Batman or something, is stuck permanently edgelording over the souls his sword has drunken in. Doesn't Batman have like a really strict no killing thing? No soul drinking thing? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's less important how much this actually describes these kind of characters than how much it describes how edgelords recreate them in their minds. So there we were, walking through the field, when the DM suddenly announces out of nowhere that his DMPC is going to get it on with my character. Though his wording is a lot more NSFW. My immediate response is no, but she's a girl. My Elric dude is doing her. My character says F off and back away. But she's gonna do him or she's gonna die. 
What? No way, I draw my sword. Elric Wannabe draws his sword and cuts her in two in one move, starting from the crotch up. What the... Why does this keep happening? This isn't exactly what I said, but it had something to the meaning. What the actual fu- That was it right there. Instant end of session, I got up and left. That was also the end of my friendship with every last person at the table that day. A few months later, I'd found a different group of folks to play with. About ten times more nerdy, but weirdly, also not as perverted. And a few years later, I ran into our missing dungeon master and figured out that he had felt very uncomfortable around those guys for his own reasons. And he had given up gaming altogether. I actually tried to reconnect with that edgelord DM a few years after he had a bad run with alcohol, and I figured we'd matured a little, but it never came to pass. Now, since the day of that campaign, I made a weird decision. I decided I was going to play only female characters from that day on, until the day I could find a game where nobody got weird about it. I'm still playing female characters, just shy of 38 years on. At this point, I don't even know if I could figure out how to do the headspace of a male character, but really, I've still not managed to meet that goal. Even since I moved from TTRPGs to MMOs, even when I ran an MMO guild where the members were mostly women, the wife of one of our only male members got weird at other female characters, so it was mostly a guild of old women playing men. In fact, one of my last tabletop RPG sessions was in 03, and that ended with the DM deciding that our player characters, having surrendered to local nobles that we knew were behind this evil plot, my character, eerily similar to that Arduin one as a grizzled soldier turned adventurer, was separated out and... This happening at a table that included the DM's wife and his six-year-old daughter. This time we got six months into the game before that occurred. <sighs> Burn my eyes out. So yeah, what the hell. There might be a few moments in the years where nothing weird happened, but it took so long to get there that the choice for character gender is just ingrained now. Gotta respect the guy for sticking to his guns for so long. 38 years is a good while to be dealing with sexist BS in your Dungeons & Dragons leisure time slash your MMO playtime. Yeah, this absolutely sucks. Now, starting with the original story, I have no idea what Arduin is like or how the game is structured, but yeah, forcing people to roll in some sort of female attributes chart, that's weird. It's very strange, especially, especially if you don't have a male attributes chart. Either chart is weird. Just let people create their characters the way they want to create them. I really love playing characters that aren't like me, and sometimes that will mean playing characters that aren't my gender. And it really sucks, to say the least, when people treat it like this very strange, very weird thing. When people act weird about it, it makes the game a hell of a lot less fun. As for the final story in 03, I have nothing to say on the matter. That That's just bad. And anyone who does that probably shouldn't be playing D&D or be in any social circles at all, really. If you guys enjoyed this episode of RPG Horror Stories and you want to let me know, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can head to the cards and check out our Roll for Insight podcast, which has recently made a return where I talk to D&D creators and get their opinions on a variety of different things. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy Tower to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you cannot think of a comment, leave the comment, Roll for what? To let me know you made it to the end of the video. Nothing's like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell. Thank you.